Okay, the last thing we need to cover before we're done with chapter two are just the different types of bonds. And you've seen some of these before, so I'm going to go relatively quickly through them. We've got um, ionic bonds. Ionic bonds where there's an exchange of electrons, right? You end up with something that's clearly positively charged and something that's clearly negatively charged. So exchange of electrons is a key thing. Now, what would be some examples of this? We've seen a few already. Things like sodium chloride or magnesium oxide. Why would these things have an exchange of electrons? Well, if we look at the periodic table, you can see that sodium, if it gives up one electron, it looks like neon, whereas chlorine, if it picks up an electron, it looks like argon. So there's going to be a very clear, very clear uh, element that wants to give something up and one that wants to accept something. So magnesium oxide is the same thing. If it gives up two, it looks like neon. Oxygen gains two to look like neon. So very clear uh, uh, exchange of electrons there in that ionic bond relationship. Because there's this exchange of electrons, you end up with a large difference in charge between the two atoms. These are relatively strong bonds. They have strong coulombic forces holding them together. That can lead to high melting points. Um, a lot of ceramics, for example, are ionic bonds. Now, there's also covalent bonding. What's the difference between covalent bonding and ionic? Well, covalent bonds, they would be things like carbon or silicon. They don't exactly give up electrons. Instead, they want to share them, right? So carbon, it could lose four, one, two, three, four, and look like helium, or it could gain four, one, two, three, four, to look like neon. So it's not totally sure if it wants to get rid of them or gain them, and instead what it does is it shares them. So it looks something like this. In diamond, carbon is bonded to four other carbons, right? So every carbon has four neighbors that are also carbons. Now, each one of these carbons has four electrons. So this guy has four that it can share. This one below it has four that it can share. The one to the right has four that it can share. The left and up above and so forth and this bond would just this motif would just continue so if you look at this by doing this by sharing they each end up with one two three four five six seven eight and that's where they want to be because then they have a filled shell and so they're happy so because of this sharing of electrons right because they share their electrons these are strong bonds, but they're also directional bonds. These tend to be strong because they're not easily going to be broken, but they're also directional. That's important. That leads to different types of crystal structures, which we will get to in a few chapters. Okay. Now, most bonds don't have just ionic or just covalent character. Um, they have a mix of both, right? Um, and here's how you calculate them. The percent ionic character can be calculated as follows. It's going to be 1 minus the exponential of, I'll clear that out of the way, negative 1 fourth multiplied by chi A minus chi B. So what is chi A and chi B? That is squared, by the way. Okay? Chi A and chi B, A and B are just the two atoms that are involved in the bond. And chi A and chi B are the electronegativity of those bonds. So again, looking at this table, this is a table of electronegativity. And you remember from earlier videos that electronegativity is how badly an element wants an extra electron. So does francium really want to pick up an electron? Not at all. It's the lowest possible. It would really like to get rid of its electron and then it looks like radon and it's very happy. Meanwhile, fluorine is only one electron away from looking like neon, so it's going to have a very high electronegativity. So the bigger the difference in electronegativity, if you take something over here and bond it with something from over here, it's going to tend to have high ionic character. But if you take things that are sort of in the middle, right, aluminum nitride, the difference between those isn't very big, 1.61 and 3.04. So you're going to end up with something that has partial ionic character. You can see some worked examples of those in the problems that we've provided in YouTube. All right, other types of bonding you have, you can have metallic. So the hallmark of metallic is you have a bunch of atoms, let's say these are aluminum atoms, arranged in some sort of fashion, which we will talk about later. And they all contribute electrons, but none of them wants to hang on to the electrons very tightly. In the case of ionic and covalent, in the case of ionic, it straight up took an electron and something gave it away, and then it was delocalized, but it, it 
it stayed put with this other ion. In the case of covalent, they were shared. So this is true delocalization. Sometimes they talk about it like there's this cloud or this sea of electrons that sort of just are all around these, right? Um, that's a bit of a, a simple explanation. It is a little more nuanced than that, but we're going to work with that for this class, a very basic idea. Which leads us with the final one, which is van der Waals. Uh, so van der Waals forces are very weak. And these are often called secondary bonding. Um, they're usually caused by things like dipoles, which... Uh, so a dipole, you remember, is when an, a molecule has a polar uh, uh, attribute to it, meaning there's charge on one side more than the other. So take water. Water's a good example. H2O, right? So you've got your oxygen, then you've got hydrogen and hydrogen. Each hydrogen gives one electron. Oxygen has six to start with, so it can give one, two, and then it goes three, four, five, six. So it has these two lone pairs out here, which causes this molecule to have this bent shape like that. Because it has a bent shape, and it has these lone pairs on one side, plus oxygen's more electronegative than hydrogen, you end up with a negative side and a positive side. There's this, um, there's this dipole across the molecule. Can you see that? And so these molecules, they're sort of shaped like that. They would line up one with another, right? When ice forms, it basically does this because you've got a positive side and a negative side. You've got a positive side and a negative side. And these things sort of stack up because the interaction is between the dipoles. This is the interaction that holds those things together in van der Waals forces. So um, are these just for things like water? No, like there's actually lots and lots of molecules where this matters. Um, plastics and polymers being the most important. Polymers, as we will learn in a few chapters, exist as long chains of carbon uh, backbones typically. And so if you've got these things, these long chains, they can line up and bond together if they have some dipole-dipole interaction. And the longer the chains, the more smoothly they can line up, the stronger those interactions can be because they can get closer. Let's say there's a little negative and a little positive. The closer those things can get together from the side groups or something, uh, the better that they can bond. So that's our van der Waals metallic, ionic, and covalent bonding.